Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And I've got a couple of announcements. Boy, are we getting close to conference. Um, every day here, we're working on conference, and you should be here, particularly if you live in Ohio. Oh my gosh, we're so close. But our speakers include Eileen Kopsaftis, our physical therapy partner, uh, Dr. Anthony Lim, who's going to be doing two lectures. One is a bonus lecture um, on the Sunday afternoon of conference. Um, Peter Bregan, our psychiatry partner, who's never prescribed drugs. Cheryl Atkinson, a former CBS news anchor, who's going to talk about some of her investigative reports on medically related issues. Um, this is a fascinating woman who basically walked out of a very high paying job over ethics. Love somebody like this. And I think you're really gonna wanna hear what she has to say. And you get a $500 certificate toward our programs if you're here. So don't miss it, you need to be here. Don't miss it, you don't wanna hear about this on Facebook and when I report next week after it how fabulous it was. Also, um, available now, you, we have added these courses to our big repertoire of courses. I think we're up to like 26 of them or something. Uh, diet, lifestyle, and diabetes, health benefits and risks of cannabis, diet, exercise, and mental health, inflammatory bowel disease, time management. Time management may seem a little bit out of place, but the biggest thing that hampers people in changing their lives positively is finding the time to shop, cook, exercise, do the things that they know they need to do. Irritable bowel syndrome, your amazing microbiome, cognitive health and Alzheimer's disease, public policy and how to change laws and uh, make a difference in a community setting, local or federal. And then a couple of mini courses on thyroid disease and polycystic ovary syndrome. So um, those are all new courses that we're beginning to offer. Some available now, some I'll be teaching live next year and then committing them to video platforms. So you early enrollers will be able to participate in the live versions of some of these. Um, then the Heart of Being Helpful, uh, Peter Bregan's new program on how to do therapy on yourself. How would it be if you could fix yourself at home with some things, right? And then Move Without Pain, Eileen Kopsaftis' new online program that allows you to um, fix your shoulders and knees and hips and all the other things that start to have pain on your own at home by watching her videos and following her directions. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, and as always, if you're interested in careers, also email me at pampopperandmsn.com. Now, a couple things in the news that I wanted to talk about. Um, I think this is really exciting. According to the head of the uh, Health and Human Services Department of the federal government, he was on a couple news shows this week, um, there is a new proposal, they just posted it in the Federal Register, so the 75 days of comment period before final decisions are made, that would require drug companies to put the prices of their drugs in their ads. Wouldn't that be swell? Because I think it would make people not so anxious sometimes to contact their doctor to take the drug. So for example, there is a cancer drug, and I'm probably going to screw up the name of this. I'm not so good on some pronunciations. Ipilimumab. The cost is $120,000 for this cancer drug. Now here is the efficacy rate for it. Three out of 540 people who took the drug became cancer free. Three out of 540. 14 died from the treatment itself. So there's a five times greater chance of dying from the treatment than there is from benefiting from it, but it costs $120,000. Now, why is this important? You know, most people have some type of insurance coverage, but also most people have co-pays and deductibles, and so certainly some of that $120,000 is gonna be paid by the cancer patient and his or her family, right? Here's another one, Zelgens, $4,284 for uh, 60 tablets for autoimmune. Um, if that's what it's prescribed for. That's a 15-day supply. Uh, one month supply is $8,568. Um, at eight weeks, if you're using it for ulcerative colitis, for example, the efficacy rate is between 17 and 18 percent, and it has a 5.8 percent efficacy rate at 52 weeks. 5.8 percent. That means almost 95 percent of the people who take this drug do not benefit and it costs $8,568 a month. That's about $100,000 a year. And again, a person who has insurance coverage will certainly see a lot of that covered, but will most certainly pay part of the cost. So good to know. And I think that if people saw this as part of the commercials, uh, just think about the TV ads where they list all the side effects and everything of the drug. I think if this were included, people might say, mm, I don't know. I don't think that I can really, I don't think I'm so interested in that drug after all. 
So um, let's hope that this becomes a rule. Now, as you might imagine, guess who's screaming and hollering about this? It's a bad idea. It's terrible. Is the drug companies. They don't want people to know the prices. They don't want people to know the side effects. They don't want people to know. They don't even want the FDA to know the real truth about their clinical trials. So, of course, they're screaming and hollering. And I think that's a sign that it's really a good thing to do. <laughs> Actually, when they stop screaming, we'll know that it's a bad thing to do. All right, uh, then there's a question I want to answer that was asked by a couple of you um, in comments, which I was going over this morning. Um, and, and here's what it is, and I think it's important. Why do some people appear to be able to eat anything and they don't get sick? And, and I get this sometimes from people. They say, oh my gosh, my diet isn't half as bad as most of the people I know. And here I am sitting here talking to you all sick and having to change my diet. And then there's these other people over there eating steak and cheese and french fries every day and they're fine. Well, first of all, I'll point out they're fine for now. You have no idea what's going on inside their body. And unfortunately, for many diseases, you don't think you're sick until one day you are. For example, I spoke with somebody this week who was going to very generously donate a kidney. Um, and when she went to have tests done to make sure that she could be approved as a kidney donor, um, they found out that she, her kidney functions down to 57% and she has protein in her urine. And it freaked her out, which, which is good. That's the thing to do, get freaked out and do something about it. So a lot of people think they're getting away with it, but they're not. But I'm gonna add something. You know, I teach by analogy. You guys who watch me all the time know that. And so I know people who have too much to drink and then they drive home regularly. I don't think that's a good idea, but they haven't had a DUI. I guess they're getting away with it. Um, some people steal money and they get away with it. You know, some people even get away with murder. It's a true story. You know of cases like this. I don't think that those are reasons to engage in any of those behaviors, the fact that you might get away with it, you know? So I think what we really have to do is, is really not focus on what other people are doing and what's happening to other people, but focus on objective information about the right way to take care of yourself and the wrong way and the consequences of doing either thing and then just let people decide what they want to do. But the fact that somebody else appears to be getting away with something is not really the reason to think that you might get away with something. And in fact, while people have told me for years, my uncle ate bacon, eggs, and cheese three times a day and lived to be 95 and he died in his sleep, and I believe that story, but it is a story. It's not indicative of what's li likely to happen to a lot of other people if they do those same things. All right, um, so talking about not believing everything you hear and being wary of everything you hear, th this story is almost hard to believe. You could, if I was writing fiction to deliver to you every Tuesday and Thursday, I don't think I could come up with as good a stuff as what I can come up with just looking at medical news. All right, so you might have heard of ketamine. It's an anesthetic drug that's used during surgery. It's also frequently abused. It's considered what's called a club drug, referred to as Special K. Now, if you're not familiar with club drugs, uh, they're part of the scene at nightclubs and concerts and bars and parties and raves and other social gatherings where more tendency to use recreational drugs. Special K comes in the form of a white powder. You can inject it or snort it. And here are just some of the side effects of it. Uh, you can see why this would be so much fun as a recreational drug. It causes confusion, memory loss, disturbed perception, agitation, psychosis, higher blood pressure, dizziness, double vision, nausea, vomiting, insomnia, dyskinesia, hallucinations, and extreme fear. You can see how much fun this would be at a party, for example, right? I, I don't understand this at all, but I digress. In spite of these side effects, ketamine is increasingly being used as a medical treatment in outpatient settings, and the new thing now is opening ketamine clinics like Calypso Wellness Centers. They're popping up all over the United States, and they offer infusion starting at $495 for all kinds of conditions like chronic pain, migraines, and depression. The Ketamine, the Ketamine Institute is a training program based in Sarasota, Florida, and it's run by an anesthesiologist, probably pretty excited about ketamine. Uh, the Institute advertises something called Restore Infusion Therapy, claiming that the therapy can reboot your life in just three days. Testimonials and other information posted on the site presents ketamine as a miracle treatment for psychiatric conditions like depression and anxiety and PTSD, and also advertises it as a replacement for psychiatric drugs. The Institute also offers two courses for practitioners. The Fundamentals course costs $4,950, 
And it's directed to, this is a quote, physicians who wish to quickly get the basic training necessary to safely and effectively provide ketamine infusion therapy to their patients. Um, then they have an upgraded version that costs $8,950, and this one on, includes some hands-on experience working with patients. Well, business is clearly booming. As you might imagine, I'm not the only person who's skeptical about this. A lot of health professionals are concerned that the data are so limited that you literally can't even design a program to teach health professionals how to use this safely and effectively in an outpatient setting because we just don't know enough about how it works and, and the long-term outcomes. Now, just to give you an idea of how limited the data are, I started looking into this myself. Ketamine was first reported to have a positive effect on major depressive disorder in a 2000 study involving seven patients that lasted for 72 hours. Wow, that's definitive. I mean, seriously, seven people for 72 hours, and now you're going to declare that this could be effective for depression? In 2012, a research group performed an analysis of all available published data on the effect of ketamine on depression. At that time, this is now 12 years later, a total of 163 patients with treatment-resistant depression had participated in case studies, open-label studies, or controlled trials using ketamine. Now, of course, they're not studying the people who are using it recreationally. This is just people in a pharmaceutical-type setting. The researchers reported that few studies followed patients beyond 72 hours, and many patients who show a response within 24 hours relapse by 72 hours. Some studies involved giving drugs in addition to ketamine, trying to um, prolong the positive, if you can call it that, effect of the drug beyond 72 hours, but that really didn't work so well. In one study, first dose responders were given five additional infusions in 10 days and maintained their response to, uh, during that 10 day period, but long term uh, data beyond that 10 days were not available. They just followed them for 10 days, gave them the drug every day, and they seemed to be okay. So the researchers concluded that more research is needed because of the limited number of patients studied, the short duration of follow up, and unknown long term side effects. Well, STAT, S-T-A-T, is a media company that reports on information about health medicine and scientific discoveries. So STAT looked into this, did its own investigation, and what they did was they interviewed um, ketamine clinic owners and different psychiatrists and patients, and they also looked at documents and screening protocols for these various clinics, and one thing they concluded was that there were huge inconsistencies between the clinics on many issues. So if, as limited as the data supporting ketamine is, um, a further problem is depending upon where you go for treatment, you may get complete, you know, completely different treatment than someplace else. So some of the differences included how patients were screened before treatment, frequency of infusions, the doses, communications with patients, mental health providers. The analysis showed that in some clinics, little screening was done, and the screening that was done appeared to be, can you afford to pay for it? And if yes, we consider you screened for infusions. Um, many clinics didn't have a psychiatrist on staff in spite of the fact, or any mental health professional, in spite of the fact that a lot of people who sought this treatment were people who had failed at other types of, of mental health treatment, some of whom would be suicidal, and there was nobody on site to supervise this. Not all clinics required that patients maintain a relationship with some sort of health mental health professional. Staff in some clinics exaggerated potential benefits, offered ketamine for conditions for which it hasn't been well studied, not that it's been well studied for anything, and promoted blended products that haven't been researched at all. Well, in spite of this information, ketamine prescribing is increasing, and the drug even has now its own advocacy group. The Ketamine Advocacy Network promotes opportunities for people to volunteer for a clinical trial. The group's website states that research is needed to determine how ketamine works and the potential for ketamine to, quote, revolutionize the way doctors and the public think about depression. Now my comment about this is that things didn't work out so well the last time doctors and the public revolutionized their thinking about depression because this involved inventing the idea that chemical imbalances in the brain were the cause of psychological conditions like depression and anxiety. Millions of people were given drugs to treat the mythical condition and the healthcare system and society haven't even begun to recover from the damage done from this. So ketamine is not a better alternative, it's just another money-making scheme that benefits drug companies and doctors who are ignorant and don't pay attention to the things that they should pay attention to. And it's another looming disaster for public health. So um, the reason I wanted to cover this is that, for, interestingly enough, I got a couple of um, inquiries from people who had been recommended this treatment by a healthcare professional. 
And um, so I thought, well, it's a good time to look into it and see what we can find. And this is what I found. All right. Well, thank you for watching. And as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And also hit the subscribe button so you can get these videos every week. I put out a lot of interesting stuff that I know will help you protect your health. I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.